Hi, good evening. It's Pastor Steve, and this is an unusual version of the Midweek Bible Class. Uh, it's Monday night, and it's October 1st, and we intended to film this class in Syosset. We had it all set up, but unfortunately the internet failed in Syosset, and we were not able to film anything. And since I leave for Hawaii tomorrow, I thought I'd just come home and film it in my house in kind of an expedited fashion. And so if this is your means of watching the Midweek Bible Class, my apologize for the difference. Um, this will be a little shorter class, but I think giving you the nuts and bolts by which uh, what we covered uh, in the class tonight. First thing is to begin with prayer, which is what we always do. Let's do that now. Father, we thank you for the privilege we have to study your word. We pray, Lord, that you would make it alive for us this evening and powerful and teach us what you would have us to learn in this uh, challenging passage. Good narrative, but difficult passage. We pray that you would bless our time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So first of all, let's look at the quiz. And uh, we have the quizzes posted online. So if you want to follow all online, you can see the quizzes there. You can fill it out in advance and return back to the video if you like. But uh, here's the quiz. Uh, first one is question number one. Eli, the priest's family line is about to come to an end. He is probably replaced by, and here's your choices, Aaron, Samuel, Zodak, and David. And the answer for this is C, Zodak, is the one that most scholars believe is the one who's going to replace Eli's family line. Now, I pointed this out last week if you were in class that Zodak will probably show up in a quiz, and he certainly did. Here's number two, Hannah's prayer sounds a lot like, so again, Hannah, her prayer sounds a lot like A, Mary's song, B, the Magnificat, C, Moses' song, D, Psalm 119. And the answer is A and B. It most certainly sounds like Mary's song in Luke chapter 1. And Mary's song in Luke chapter 1 is called the Magnificat, and also Hannah's song is called the Magnificat. And so both of those are the right answer. Moses does indeed have a song written in the Pentateuch, but it's not that similar to Hannah's song. And Psalm 119 is an acrostic, meaning each stanza begins with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet, but it has nothing to do with uh, Hannah's song. Number three, you have a hint that you are reading Hebrew poetry, noticing a parallelism, B, Mirisms, C, narrative, D, no capitals. And the answer is A, parallelism, and B, mirisms. Now, what is parallelism? It's when you have a phrase in the beginning that is kind of magnified in the second line. So the Lord is a great God, might be line number one. And line number two is his greatness extends to the far reaches of the earth. So that is just a magnification of what happened in line one. That's a parallelism. And mirisms, we talked about last week, that just means opposites. And so uh, the wealthy will become poor and the poor will become wealthy. That would be a mirism where you're seeing an opposite take place. So number four, who is a son of Belial? Now we've heard of a daughter of Belial and that's what Hannah says, please don't mistake me for a wicked woman which is daughter of Belial in the original Hebrew. Who is the son of Belial in the Hebrew? Well, it is either A, Hophni, B, Samuel, C, Eli, or D, Elkanai. And it is Hophni. Um, and in that particular case, the NIV translates it scoundrel along with his brother. But it is literally in the Hebrew, son of Belial. So the answer is A. Number five. Who's enthroned, excuse me, who encountered a theophany? Who encountered a theophany? Well, you have A, Eli, B, Samuel, C, Hannah, D, Elkanai. And the answer is, it is Samuel. This is chapter 3, when the Lord speaks, Samuel, Samuel. And he quickly runs to Eli, what is it? And eventually, by the third time, Eli says, no, that's the Lord talking to you. Answer, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And as the text unfolds, this is a visible manifestation of God. Some people argue a Christophany 
uh, a representation of Jesus in the Old Testament. Um, and in that case, we see a theophany. Theo, meaning God, and phani, meaning his presence or the presence of God. And why do we sometimes think it could be a Christophany? Is because Hebrews tells us in chapter 1 that Jesus is the exact representation of the Father. And so when we see a physical representation of God, people automatically think, could this be a pre-incarnate visitation of Jesus? So next one, number six. The phrase Dan to Beersheba can be compared to A, soup to nuts, B, New York to California, C, the love of God, D, marriage. And the answer is soup to nuts or New York to California. Dan is the most northern point of Israel, Beersheba the most southern point. And so when you're referring to all of Israel, you say from Dan to Beersheba. Number seven, who lacks vision? A, Samuel, B, Hannah, D, B, it's, it should be C, it says in our text B, but it's C, Eli, or D, Phineas. And the answer is Eli. Eli's sight is failing, but we also see he's lacking vision in terms of not being able to see God's ways. And so Eli is the answer, so it's C, Eli. Number eight, which name of God first shows up in 1 Samuel in our Bibles? A, Lord Almighty. B, the God who sees me. C, Lord who provides. And D, Elohim. And it is A, Lord Almighty, which is Yahweh Sabaoth, uh, sometimes translated like King James, Lord of Hosts. Uh, B, which is the God who sees me, that shows up in Genesis when Hagar is in the wilderness and she gives God a brand new name, Yahweh Roy. And then the Lord who provides Yahweh Yira or Jehovah Jireh, you might have heard it. That's also in Genesis when Abraham gives that name to God, when God provides the ram caught in the thicket for his sacrifice instead of his son Isaac. And Elohim just means God, but take note of the I am ending Elohim. I am is a plural in Hebrew. And when it comes to the name of God, it's not that there are multiple gods. It refers to his greatness, kind of like the Queen of England speaking in the pronoun of the plural pronoun. We have decided that is referring to her glory when she uses that plural pronoun. And number nine, who delivers the first prophetic word in 1 Samuel? Who is the first prophecy? A, Samuel, B, Eli, C, Hannah. D. Zodak. And the answer is Hannah. She prophesies that there would one day be a king, and that shows up in her song. So I hope you did well on the quiz. I thought it was one of our easier ones. But with that in mind, let's go to the text. And tonight we're looking on chapter 4 and 5. These are not long chapters, but they are sad chapters. So we read chapter 4 this way. And it ends with a line from the previous chapter. And Samuel's word came to all of Israel. So we finished last week learning about Samuel and that his, he becomes a defined spokesman of the Lord. But now we're not going to hear from him until he's an older man. Now we're just going to hear some incidents that are happening with Israel. And we read this. The Philistines capture the ark. And here's what it goes. Now the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. The Israelites encamped at Ebenezer and the Philistines at Aphek. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel, and as the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 of them on the battlefield. When the soldiers returned to camp, the elders of Israel asked, why did the Lord bring defeat on us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Lord's Covenant from Shiloh so that he may go with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. So the people went to Shiloh and they brought back the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord Almighty who was enthroned between the cherubim and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were, with, uh, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. When the Ark of the Lord's Covenant 
came into the camp, all Israel raised such a great shout that the ground shook. Hearing the uproar, the Philistines asked, What is all the shouting in the Hebrew camp? When they learned about the ark of the Lord had come into the camp, the Philistines were afraid. A god has come into the camp, they said. Oh no, nothing like this has happened before. We're doomed. Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? They were the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. Be strong, Philistines. Be men, or you will be subject to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought, and the Israelites were defeated, and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. The Ark of the Covenant, or the Ark of God, was captured, and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. Now that is a tragic passage. Um, but let's go back to the beginning and, and break it down. And first of all, we're introduced to the Philistines. Now the Philistines are going to be a nemesis for the people of Israel for a long time to come. Who are these Philistines? Uh, we use the phrase when we talk, to talk about somebody being barbaric, we'll call them a Philistine. But what they are, what the word actually means is sea peoples. And we're not really sure where they come from. We've tried to guess. Some people think Cyprus. Some people think Crete. Some people think maybe one of the Grecian islands. But we're not really sure whether they were moving across the Mediterranean because of desperate need or whether they came just as an expansion of their empire. We don't know. But this we do know. They attacked Egypt first under Ramses III. But Egypt was a very strong uh, land. And in class, I actually showed a picture of the hieroglyphs that the Ramses III had made showing their defeat of these sea peoples. So what did they do? They moved a little up the coast, they invaded there, and they had success. And that became then the nemesis people for the children of Israel. So the battle unfolds this way. The people of Israel are fighting from Ebenezer, which is kind of in the middle range between the coast and the mountains of Israel. And then, of course, we read that the Philistines are camped at Ephek. Now, this battle is not a good one. According to the text, 4,000 people die on the Israelite side. So it's a terrible defeat. Um, sad, tragic. And uh, you have to also keep in mind that Israel has been subject to Philistine rule at this time. Now, what does this mean? It doesn't mean that there was Philistine soldiers on every street corner in an occupied force. But it means that the Philistines were kind of like the neighborhood bully. And you paid them tribute or you made sure all the resources ultimately ended up in their land or they would come and attack you and take things from you. So... That was the realm of Israel, kind of under the thumb of the Philistines. So, as this battle ensues, it goes poorly for the Israelites. So, what we read is the elders of Israel asked the question, a great question, why did the Lord bring defeat on us today? This is verse 3. Now, that is an incredible, good question. Unfortunately, I don't think they waited for the Lord to answer that question. They looked for human answers. Now, who are the elders of Israel? The elders of Israel is a tribal community, meaning representatives from each tribe of Israel, and together they would speak corporately of authority over Israel. What is interesting is Israel actually has a judge who is in charge at this time. We've bumped into this person before. Although he hasn't been officially called a judge, he is one. His name is Eli, the priest. He should have been taking charge. He should have been in a place of leadership, but he wasn't. And so in the vacuum of leadership, the elders of Israel say, what happened? And the answer comes back, oh, I know what we need to do. Let us bring the Ark of the Lord's Covenant from Shiloh into the battle so we'll win this battle. So Shiloh is where the temple of the Lord is. It's a tent at this point. 
and it's 22 miles away from Ebenezer where the Israelites are encamped. And so this thought was, let's bring God into our camp and then we're going to win. Now you may pause and say, why did they get this idea that bringing the Ark of the Covenant might be successful for fighting a battle? Well, if you think about it, remember when Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. They actually went around the city of Jericho with trumpets and carrying the Ark of the Covenant. And they probably thought, oh, it worked then, it'll work now. The big difference then is that it was under God's instruction. Now it's under their whim. They never wait for the answer of God as to why they lost this battle. They just decide, let's bring our God into battle. And they treat God kind of like God in the box. So when they bring this ark into the camp, the Israelites cheer, kind of like, our God is here, wonderful, great, awesome. But the Philistines hear this cheering, and they're in a panic. They said, a God has come into the camp. Actually, gods have come into the camp. Now, their comments are interesting. If you look at verse 8, this is what they say. We're doomed. Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? Now, listen to the description. These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. Now, there's some things right with their, assumption, with their understanding and some things wrong. First of all, it's not gods, plural, it's one god. But they think like it must be lots of gods, like we have lots of gods. And the second one is that the Egyptians were struck with plagues in the wilderness. No, they were struck with plagues in Egypt. So what they're correct about is that this god defeated the gods of the Egyptians and through plagues, but they just have some of the details wrong. It's one god, not multiple gods. It wasn't in the wilderness. It was in Egypt. It doesn't matter, though. The troops are saying, be strong, be men, and if we're not, we're going to lose, and then we'll be subjected to the Hebrews ruling over us. Do you want that to happen? And so what happens instead? The Philistines fight furiously, and they succeed. They prevail, killing, get this, 30,000 of the Israelite foot soldiers. And then comes this very tragic piece of information. The Ark of God was captured in Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, had died. Now, just a word here. We've heard about the ending of Hophni and Phinehas. You may remember when we were at 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 34, we heard God's judgment against Hophni and Phinehas. It said that they were going to die on the same day. So what we're seeing here is the fulfillment of that prophecy. And when you read this phrase, everyone go back home to your own tent, you have to think in terms of like American history, the Civil War, or the Revolutionary War. When a war is fought on your own land and your army is destroyed, what do people ultimately do? They run home to protect their own family. And so that is what that call is. Go home to your own tent and de defend your wife and your children. Very, very, very sad story. Which brings us to the next section of this chapter entitled The Death of Eli. We read, starting in verse 12, That same day a Benjamite ran from the battle line and went to Shiloh, with his clothes torn and dust on his head. When he arrived, there was Eli sitting on his chair by the side of the road, watching because his heart feared for the ark of God. When the man entered the town and told what had happened, the whole town sent up a cry. Eli heard the outcry and asked, what is the meaning of this uproar? The man hurried over to Eli, who was 98 years old and whose eyes had failed so that he could not see. He told Eli, I have just come from the battle line. I fled from it this very day. Eli asked, what happened, my son? The man who brought the news replied, Israel fled before the Philistines and the army has suffered heavy losses. Also, your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead and the ark of God have been captured. 
When he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell backward off his chair by the side of the gate. His neck was broken and he died, for he was an old man and he was heavy. He led Israel for 40 years. His daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant and near the time of delivery. When she heard the news of the ark of God had been captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she went into labor and gave birth but as but was overcome by her labor pains as she was dying the woman attending her said don't despair you have given birth to a son but she did not respond or pay any attention she named the boy Ichabod saying the glory has departed from Israel because the capture of the ark of God and the deaths of her father-in-law and her husband she said the glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. Very painful section here. But let's break it down. Verse 12. That same day a Benjamite ran from the battle line and went to Shiloh. Now scholars pause when they see this and they think, is the author of 1 Samuel giving us a hint of the champion who is yet to come? And that is Saul. Because Saul is from the tribe of Benjamin. We haven't been introduced to him yet, but he will be the first king of Israel. See, the author did not have to mention that this runner was a Benjamite, but maybe he is mentioning it because of this element of this will be Israel's next champion, next leader when they have a king. Regardless, this guy is running what amounts to 22 miles from Ebenezer to Shiloh. So a marathon today is 26.2 miles and this is pretty close to a marathon. Probably took him three, four, five hours to make this run with the news of what had happened. It says his clothes are torn and there's dust in his head. Now this very well could be his clothes are torn from battle and the dust in his head from the battle. Or it could be that he is grieving the news he is about to give. Because in Hebraic culture when you're brokenhearted, you might rend your garment and put dust on your head. Both of those are plausible and possible. It's hard to know which one. However, it's a sad case regardless. When he arrives, Eli was sitting on his chair by the side of the road. That's interesting because the last time we hear about Eli on a chair, he is sitting in the seat of Moses by the temple where people come to ask his discerning of the law in let's say local disputes but now he's on the edge of the road in a chair waiting for news about the Ark of the Covenant notice his primary interest is in the Ark not even his own sons I genuinely think because of the prophecy of the Lord he's not expecting a lot from his sons as to whether they're going to survive or not but the Ark of the Covenant this seems to be a big deal so apparently this runner, though, comes in a way that is not by Eli, but Eli hears the wail of those in the town about the bad news. So he cries out, I need to hear the news. What is this uproar? And that man then came to Eli with this bad news. Now, we get a description of Eli. He's 98, and his eyes have failed, so he cannot see. So metaphorically, he cannot see, he lacks vision, but physically he cannot see, and he's a very old man. And here's what he says, I've come from the battle line this very day. What happened, my son? And here's the news. Israel fled before the Philistines. The army suffered major losses. Your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God has been captured. Now what do you think would make the biggest news for him? seems like it's the Ark of the Covenant. Look at the next verse. When he mentioned the Ark of God, Eli fell backward off his chair up by the side of the gate. His neck was broken and he died, for he was an old man and he was heavy. It seems like he anticipated something bad would come of Hophni and Phinehas. Mind you, Eli genuinely believes in God. And he genuinely believes that God's words will come true. And this has been prophesied. So it seems like he was mentally ready for that to happen. But the Ark of the Covenant being captured, that took him off guard. He falls back and we learn another quality of him. He's very heavy. 
Some scholars speculate that heaviness comes because of he was joining in with Hophni and Phinehas of robbing the people at sacrifice time, something we learned a couple chapters ago. And so, very, very sad thing. But after we hear this, we hear this, that he led Israel for 40 years. This is our evidence that Eli was the judge at the time. You might say this section is almost like the rest of the book of Judges unfolding. Eli was a leader, but he wasn't a leader. There was a vacuum of leadership during his time. How do we know this? His miserable way of leading his sons. He failed in leading them. But secondly, the fact that it was the elders of Israel who made this brainiac decision to take the ark of God into battle seems to convey that Eli wasn't showing any leadership whatsoever. And now comes this final sad story. His daughter-in-law, the wife of Phineas, was pregnant and about time to give birth. When she heard the news of the Ark of God, notice that's the primary thing that shocks her, had been captured, and her father-in-law and her husband were dead. She went into labor and gave birth. Now, if you have a like English Standard Version, it'll say she bowed and gave birth. Bowed is a Hebrew colloquialism for squatting and delivering a baby. But that's why the NIV says she went into labor and, and delivered this baby. The bowing was not a physical bowing like in worship. It was a bowing to give birth. But it seems that the ark is a bigger deal than even the deaths of her family members. And I want you to remember, was Phineas a decent husband? No, he wasn't. How do we know this? He's sleeping with the women who serve at the entrance of the temple. And he's married and not faithful. So this woman is probably a sad woman regardless. But the Ark of the Covenant, that represents God's presence. That represents hope for them. And that that is captured took her last vestige of hope. So it's funny, the women around her say, Oh, even though you're dying, be cheerful. You gave birth to a son. Very Jewish-like. You know, son is worth everything. But she doesn't respond. The last thing she says, name him Ichabod, which is actually a conjunction of two words, which is without or no. And that last word, which comes from the Hebrew word, I think it's kabod, which means glory. And it is the glory is gone. Glory, no. Glory departed because the glory of Israel, which she viewed as the Ark of the Covenant, is gone. What a sad word, Ichabod. The sad thing is I have been to churches that could have that word, Ichabod, written on them. You just have no sense of glory. You have no sense of God's power is at work. That happens, unfortunately. I tell you, it's one of my greatest fears in my own ministry that South Shelter Rock Church will never have the word Ichabod written on it. The glory has departed. You pause at a passage like this and you say, Lord, please don't depart from our home. Please don't depart from my marriage. Or please, your glory may it never depart from my children. Because this is the saddest indictment of this time in Israel's history. Which moves us now to the last chapter we're going to look at tonight. Chapter 5, which we read this. After the Philistines had captured the Ark of God, they took it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then they carried the Ark into Dagon's temple and set it beside Dagon. When the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, there was Dagon, fallen on his face on the ground before the Ark of the Lord. They took Dagon and put him on the uh, back in his place. But the following morning when they rose, there was Dagon, fallen on his face, on the ground before the ark of the Lord. His head and his hands had been broken off and were lying on the threshold. Only his body remained. That is why, to this day, neither the priests of Dagon nor any others who enter Dagon's temple at Ashdod step on the threshold. The Lord's hand was heavy on the people of Ashdod and its vicinity, and he brought devastation on them and afflicted them with tumors. When the people of Ashdod saw what was happening, they said, The ark of God of Israel must not stay here with us, 
because his hand is heavy on us and on Dagon our God. So they called together all the rulers of the Philistines and asked them, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? They answered, Have the ark of God of Israel moved to Gath. So they moved the ark of God of Israel. But after they had moved it, the Lord's hand was against that city, throwing it into great panic. He afflicted the people of the city, both young and old, with an outbreak of tumors. So they sent the ark of God to Ekron. As the ark of the, uh, God was entering Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, They have brought the ark of God of Israel around us to kill us and our people. So they called together all the rulers of the Philistines and said, Send the ark of the God of Israel away. Let it go back to its own place, or it will kill us and our people. For death has filled the city with panic. God's hand was heavy on it. Those who did not die were afflicted with tumors, and the outcry of the city went up to heaven. Boy, are these dark chapters or what? But the darkness of this one also has some humor, let's face it. After the Philistines had captured the Ark uh, of God, they took it from Ebenezer, which was uh, Israelite territory. That's where the battle was fought. And they brought it to Ashdod, which is kind of like the capital of the Philistines. It's a good distance away, I'd estimate, from Shiloh. It's probably 60 miles from where the battle was, probably 40 miles, something like that. And when they get to Ashdod, where do you put this Ark of the Covenant, which they viewed as God of Israel? So they thought, oh, let's put it in a temple. So they put it in the temple of Dagon. Now, we've heard of Dagon before in the book of Judges. I'll remind you when in a moment. So they put it in Dagon's temple, but the next day we find out that Dagon's not having a very good day because the statue representing the god, the deity of Dagon, had fallen on his face in the ground before the Ark of the Lord. This is pure humiliation. This next line, though, makes me laugh. They took Dagon and put him back in his place. If you worship a god that you have to pick up you're not worshiping the right God. Isaiah put it this way. People go into the forest and they cut down a tree. Half the tree they use to cook their meals and to build their shelters. The other half of the tree they carve into a God and bow down to it. And he points out the absurdity of this. They got to pick up their God. But the following morning when they rose, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the Ark of the Lord, same thing as before, a little different though. His head was removed and his hands were broken off, lying on the threshold, only his body remained. Now, this is total humiliation. When Saul, King Saul, chapters from now, is ultimately killed in battle, the Philistines will cut off his head and hang it on the temple. Why? That is the way you show absolute humility of the country that you have just conquered. This head of Dagon being removed shows that complete humility. There's another funny thing, though, that shows up in this. What else is missing of Dagon? He's lost his head, but he's also lost his hands. Look at this next phrase in verse 6. The Lord's hand was heavy on the people of Ashdod. What we see is the Lord Almighty has hands. Dagon, not so much. And verse 5 is intriguing. That is why to this day neither the priests of Dagon or any others who enter Dagon's temple of Ashdod step on the threshold. So the author of the book is saying, even though it was written much, much later, to this day the Philistines remember the day that their god Dagon's head and hands ended up on their threshold of the temple. And that became a holy place, so you don't step on the threshold. And that to this day, Dagon's humiliation is remembered. So, where have we bumped into Dagon before? You might remember it. If you think back to the book of Judges, there was a Nazarite. Think of a Nazarite in the book of Judges? Samson. And remember at the end, his eyes were plucked out, and he was brought to the temple of Dagon and he prayed Lord give me strength one more time and he was put his hands between the two main support pillars of the temple he pushes 
and the entire temple of Dagon collapses. And then the scripture says he killed more in his death than he did while he was alive. And that shows that this Dagon was the rebuilt temple from the previous time the Lord God of hosts had destroyed the temple of Dagon, or at least destroyed Dagon. So it's just an interesting story. And it shows that in the midst of defeat, there is this hint that God is God overall. I want to pause and just remind you because the Israelites are falling under bad theology here. What is the bad theology? God is in a box. The Philistines are interpreting this theology incorrectly themselves. This God is in a box and he's amongst us. But Isaiah goes very clearly to point out that nothing can hold the presence of God and that this world is but his footstool. And so even though the imagery of God is encapsulated in the Ark of the Covenant and that his Shekinah glory, his presence, his cloud is evident in the Ark, God was never the God of the box. The box, the Ark of the Covenant, was a reminder of the presence of God amongst the people. And just a reminder, what is the Ark of the Covenant? It was a box that Moses instructed the people to make at God's command, and inside of it was the Ten Commandments, uh, a, a sample of manna, and also Aaron's rod that had budded. And these things were in the Ark of the Covenant. So how does our chapter end? Well, nobody wants the Ark nearby. So it first shows up in this community of Ashdod. I wish I could show you a map. I don't have a map at home to show you. But it goes from Ebenezer to Ashdod, and then it goes from Ashdod to Gath, and then it goes from Gath to Ekron. And everywhere it goes, the people start getting sick with tumors, and the Philistines are like, if we keep this God here, we're done for. And so we have the beginning of the end of this stay of the ark in the Philistine territory with this word, bring the ark back to where it comes from. So I end this study with this word. If this was your quiet time in the morning, reading these two chapters, Israel is defeated, not once, but twice. Devastating defeat. Then the ark is captured. Then the bad news kills Eli. We already find that his sons are dead. And now this child is born with the name Ichabod, the glorious departed. And then Dagon collapses and then tumors and then we need to send this back to Israel. If this was your quiet time, what would be your thought for the day? So you're riding on the Long Island Railroad, you're, you're taking your trip, you're driving in your car, you're pondering this. What would be your thought for the day? See, all scripture, Paul says in 2 Timothy, is useful for teaching and, and inspiring. It's all God breathed. So what would you take away? Here's what somebody in class said tonight. You know what I take away? That in the midst of defeat, God is still on the throne. It's shown because of Dagon bowing down before him. It's shown because of the Philistine people getting sick. God remains in charge. I thought that was a great insight. And for me, I think the biggest insight is that not wanting to have Ichabod written on me, written on my family, written on my church. Father, may your glory always be evident among your people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you soon. I leave tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. for Hawaii, the Big Island. I hope to enjoy that and hopefully not tear my quadricep again. Anyway, have a great day. Bye-bye.